Hi, everyone. Welcome to our fourth Universalist service video. As you can tell, this is our Halloween service. My name is Reverend Skyler Vogel. I serve here as the senior minister at our congregation, and I use he, him pronouns. I'm so glad that you've joined us for this video. What follows are selections from our Halloween service right on October 31st. In this video, you will hear a reading, my reflection, and then a lively discussion between myself and our Director of Religious Education, Ember Kelly. You're invited to check out the video in our audio podcast each and every week. It's posted on our website, on social media, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and your favorite podcast streaming sites. If you like what you see, we hope you will give us a positive review. You'll like or comment, share, and subscribe to help spread the Fourth Universalist media further. Finally, we acknowledge that our community here in New York City is located on the land of the Muncie Lenape peoples. This acknowledgement helps us continue the work of dismantling ongoing legacies of oppression, part of our eighth principal work. We hope you'll join us for that and for a service every week at 11 o'clock in person or online. Thanks so much for watching. Have a great time. Today's reading is by Pablo Nadaru, a Chilean poet and diplomat who won the Nobel Peace Prize for Literature in 1971. The poem we read today is entitled, Lost in the Forest. Lost in the forest, I broke off a dark twig and lifted its whisper to my thirsty lips. Maybe it was the voice of the rain crying a cracked bell, or a torn heart. Something from far off, it seemed, deep and secret to me, hidden by the earth, a shout muffled by huge autumns, by the moist half-open darkness of the leaves. Wakening from the dreamy forest there, the hazel sprig sang under my tongue, its drifting fragrance climbed up through my conscious mind, as if suddenly the roots I had left behind cried out to me, the land I had lost with my childhood, and I stopped. Wonder, wounded by that wondering scent. Many years ago, uh, my family signed a 100-year lease on a small plot of land in the southern wilds of Wyoming. The annual rent was and still is $1. The land, which includes a cabin, is isolated, part of why it's only $1. And in ideal conditions, the drive is roughly an hour by dirt road to the nearest town and 8,000 feet above sea level. The terrain is mostly scrubby grasslands and sage with pockets of forests, and wooded groves. My father had driven cattle near there in his youth, spending the summers on horseback, steering them south to the factories. Decades later, the cowboys are gone, but the ruggedness remains. There, there is no cell phone service or telephones, no electricity or lights, only unheated well water and outhouses. The worst part, though, for me, was always that the cabin was full of mice. We'd have to clean their droppings every time we'd arrived, from the sofas, the floors, but also the beds and the mattresses. I didn't want any part of that. As soon as I was old enough, I wanted out. I let the grown-ups stay in with the mice. I was going to sleep out in the woods by myself like an adult where it was clean and I could do what I wanted. My parents 
were hesitant to allow this. There were bears in the woods and wolves too, also rattlesnakes. If something happened, they were far away and we were all collectively miles away from any help. Nonetheless, they let me set up my tent at the edge of the, of the property in a wooded glade of aspen trees. It was beautiful and picturesque, white bark, yellow leaves, all reflecting in the sun. I set the, set the tent door facing the thickest part of the woods. It felt like it was the most interesting view and where, if anything unsettling was happening, I could keep an eye on it as it emerged from that dense woods. But what seemed like a brilliant idea during the day felt different after the sun had gone down. That night, as I went to find my tent, I realized just how far away I was from everyone in that cabin. As I climbed inside, I noticed just how flimsy and unbearproof the nylon sides of my tent were. Looking out, I could see only a, that thick set of trees. I saw only foreboding blackness. And there was a silence, which was unsettling, as was whatever would occasionally disrupt it, causing some, maybe some wind or animal in the dark. Would anyone hear me, I wondered, if I cried out for help. I was surrounded by a forest I could not see or know and a vastness I couldn't anticipate or control. Closing the tent, turning off my flashlight, and falling asleep was an act of faith that whatever was out there in that dark quiet would not take advantage of the vulnerability that I had in my cheap nylon tent. Eventually, I fell into an uneasy sleep. Sometime in the night, something ran into my tent. I woke up instantly, even half asleep. I remembered that for a split second, the tent shook violently, one side compressed inwards before it returned to form. I froze not wanting to make a sound. I stopped breathing, worrying that the sound of my breath to the silence out there would be heard. My eyes were open wide, searching for some sign of what was happening, but I saw nothing. And then I heard footsteps, the crunching of sticks and grass outside my tent slow and deliberate steps circling around me. Pause, step, pause, step. Then just like that, the tent shook again. I couldn't decide what was more disturbing, hearing the sounds, getting my arm hit as the tent moved in and out again. All was black and silent again. And I wondered what was scarier, the sound of the footsteps or the silence when they paused. I imagined someone during that silence, something just standing above me in my tent, waiting. After a few minutes of holding my breath and listening with every ounce of my body and hearing nothing, I gathered the courage quietly grab my flashlight. I found the zipper in the dark, making a little bit too much noise than I wanted, but I began to open the tent door. The zipper echoed in the silence. I peered out in the blackness. I could see or hear nothing. I picked up my flashlight, flipped it on, and pointed it outwards into the trees. And I stared. I saw eyes everywhere. Dozens of golden orbs piercing the darkness, watching me, 
not moving, but very focused. I could not see what those eyes were attached to or what bodies held them up. I could not tell what minds were staring at me and processing my emergence into their dark world. There was nothing for me to do but turn off my flashlight, slowly zip up my tent, and retreat back inside and hope for the best. Hope that whatever was out there would not decide to come in where I was. I woke up next in the morning, and they were gone. I still do not know what those eyes belong to. A herd of deer sheltering in the woods? Maybe a group of cows that had wandered way beyond where they were supposed to wander, as cows are known to do. Maybe it was a pack of wolves inspecting an uninvited guest to their territory. And yet, eerily, the next morning, I could find no trace of my nighttime visitors. There were no tracks, no pressed grass as deer or cows leave if they sleep, no droppings, no anything. When I told this story to my brother that morning, he joked that I must have seen ghosts or werewolves or forest spirits. You never know what happens in the woods at night, he said. That did not reassure me. Whatever it was that was outside my tent and disturbed my sleep, though he was right, you never know what happens in the woods, especially at night. Woods are otherworldly. Now today, Halloween, we think of it as a thin time. The ancients would talk about the veil between our world and the spirit world as especially thin today and especially tonight. It's a time for spirits to cross over, for our imaginations to run wild, where anything is possible. But forests and woods are thin places, too, and they always have been. They are places where the extraordinary happens, places of, of enchantment and magic, supernatural beings and unexplainable events. Throughout history, forests represented a space physically beyond the ordinary and the predictable confines of civilization and human control. It's not a coincidence that in the very first recorded story, that of Gilgamesh, the hero confronts first, his first adversary is the spirit of the forest. As stories reflect the anxieties of their time and culture, surely it means something that humanity's earliest story told by humanity's, one of humanity's earliest civilizations, it means something that it wrestled with what it meant to leave the forest, move into cities, and yet be surrounded and still know really well the power of the natural world, and those vast forests around their frail civilization. To enter the forest was to leave society, was to leave the safety of the town walls. It was to confront the forest's refusal to be bound by human rules and expectations. This is a theme that continues throughout history. In the early Middle Ages, Christians sought to spread their faith in all directions, but it was the forest that held out. Their pagan traditions persisted and resisted. The domain of Druid sorcery witchcraft, and other powers with sources beyond the church, they were in the forests. We see again, as our kids pointed out, in Shakespeare and fairy tales that, folk, that forests are subversive and surprising, places where even genders are fluid, where power dynamics are subverted, and normal rules no longer apply. But alongside this tradition of rebellious, subversive forests lies in opposing tradition. 
It's a tradition of the forest from civilization triumphant. This is a story that most of us are taught once we've outgrown the forest fairy tales. A forest of civilization is a place of leisure and peaceful beauty, a forest of morning strolls and rustic escapes. That kind of forest is a forest we feel completely safe, that's been tamed and colonized. A forest where the woodland spirits of Gilgamesh have been vanquished and the forest druids have been converted. There is no threat of magic or subversion or danger. The forest that features prominently in spiritualities that proclaim the beauty of nature as one's religion and also forgets anything unpleasant, which is forgotten or purged. Now, I agree that trees and forests are beautiful. I love them as spiritual places, as refuges and retreats. But we lose something deeply important if we embrace only the sanitized forest. Not only does it disconnect us from thousands of years of human tradition and storytelling and teaching, but it's not even what forests really are. Do not forget that for most of human history, woods were those mythic forests, not sanitized. They were dangerous and unpredictable. They were places you avoided, whether because you believed there was magic that was in there, or because they were often beyond the literal law, havens for bandits and outlaws. If we look at our non-human siblings, we know that no matter how big of an animal or plant you are, forests, like the natural world, are always theaters of life and death, prey and predator. Forests were and still are the opposite of safe for so many. It is some kind of privilege that allows us to experience forests only in a sanitized way. The privilege of having safe shelter at night rather than sleeping in the woods or a nearby park. Maybe a privilege of having most parks and forests so far away from the unaddressed poverty that leads us to crime, far away in places like Wyoming. We don't have to worry. Maybe there's privilege that comes from systematically eliminating whole species of wild animals who threaten our position as apex predator. Or maybe there's just a simple privilege of ignoring the alternative reality that forests offer us, that they've symbolized for millennia, that suggests that our society is not structured in a way that it should be. That subversiveness of the forest spirit of Gilgamesh, the Druids knew of Shakespeare and fairy tales, that there is a good subversion, and our society needs that kind of subversion, but it would require us to change in some radical, scary way. As Unitarian Universalists, we are especially at risk for creating a sanitized version of the forest. The temptation as a religion grounded in the Enlightenment is to fetishize the pursuit of knowledge for the purpose of control using more flowery language. Forests, if they're managed and cultivated, they have their own gifts and their own beauty, but they're not wild. A spirituality that views forests only as respites and retreats, it ignores the radical alternatives they offer. A face that sees forests as vehicles for peace and tranquility forgets the possibility of transformation. It's always occurring within. Whatever the reason, if we lose the historic and subversive nature of the forest, we lose its full power. The power offered also by Halloween, that within the thinness of worlds lies alternative and life-giving possibility. The wonderful thing is that unlike Halloween, forests are with us all year round. We don't have to wait for one day to get that experience. They are thin places that are there whenever we need them 
to break out of the normalcy of our lives whenever civilization wears us down. So the next time you are in the woods, whether Central Park or your local park or in a grove someplace like the mountains of Wyoming, try and tap into that feeling of thinness that our society makes us skeptical of. Try to imagine where the magic is, where the enchantment might be, where the reason and rationality can fall away. Shed your modern desire for trees and woods to be tame, to feel peaceful and civilized, that you should feel like they exist for you and your needs, rather for their own wild, beautiful ways. When you are out there the next time, when you are out there at night or during the mid-morning or late afternoon, and you glance out into a thick grove of trees, and you see something that you might not expect, whether those are eyes staring back at you, you feel a shiver of fear. Stare at that in wonder. Let it sit with you. Stop to imagine the possibilities, the beauties, the subversiveness, and you will know what a forest truly is. And I hope you will be glad. May it be so, and amen. Hi, everybody. My name is Ember Kelly, and I'm the Director of Religious Education here at Fourth Universalist. I use she and her pronouns, uh, and I'm so excited to get to join you for this fun uh, video today. Uh, my, I'm calling it my look, the eclectic snake queen, uh, witch, maybe. Um, so it's a nice long costume name, and uh, we had a lot of fun today with getting to have kids and a few adults wear some costumes to, to the service today. Uh, it was just a really great time getting to, to celebrate the holiday. But we had a real interesting message thinking about forests. So Reverend Schuyler, it's great to sit down with you, but I got to ask, where did this idea come from? You know, it was, it was definitely a challenge when you mentioned it to me and I had to think about what to do for a time for all ages. Well, you did great. And well, I know we'll talk more about, about what, you, what you brought in for that time for all ages and how you made it uh, easily accessible for kids. And I think a lot of it does start with, with childhood and, and how we understand trees and forests um, as essentially magical places. Um, as uh, I talked about in my sermon, this idea of thin, uh, Halloween being a thin time and that forests are thin places, uh, places where um, things are unpredictable, they're magical. Uh, we hear a lot about enchanted forests. And, uh, and so I wanted to dive into this uh, idea of a forest uh, like that um, and also contrast it with, I think, what are so often these days sort of a sanitized, tame forest that um, so many of us talk about um, when we think about um, spiritualities of forests and we think about going to the forest for rest or relaxation or or to commune with nature there's a there's something missing in those characterizations which is this other side of forest that has been really an, an ancient um, and almost in dominant perception of forest which is they're not they're not tame they're not they're not peaceful um they can be but they also uh have um have something that's more wild in them that we can control. And so I think there is something lost uh, when we only see one side of that coin. And I think Halloween, given that it is a, a thin time and that forests are thin places, uh, seemed like a good time to reflect on this. I'm curious also, was there any resources you drew from this, things that you might recommend folks read if they're interested in thinking about something similar? Sure. Yeah. So I have two books here. I'll show them on my phone if you can. You can see. Oh, maybe that's not going to work. Um, I'll just read them out. Maybe we could screen share this or add it to the video. I don't know. Um, Forest: The Shadow of Civilization by Robert Pogue Harrison, um, which is a more recent book. It's a meditation on the role of forests um, throughout history, uh, but also for the perception of forests, the idea of forests, not the actual uh, physicality of forests. And then there's an old old book. Um, from close to 100 years ago called The Forest in Folklore and Mythology by Alexander Porteus, um, which is uh, 
also a useful book um, and will help me read about this. But I think, you know, I think what is more important than any specific reading is an awareness about how often forests show up in, in story, tell, story tales and, and in narratives and movies and, and TV shows and just how forests are portrayed. Um, and we, we hear about it every sin, since we're children, right, about the enchanted forests and uh, Hansel and Gretel going into the woods, right? I mean, there's just so many, so many different avenues that would come up in the collective imagination that we have. So, so you can read those great books, and I think they're fantastic guides to the idea of forests over time. And also, um, we don't have to look that far if we're being, being curious about it. Well, if you're watching this in video format, I am going to have Reverend Schuyler send the picture so that we can include the screen share into the video. Uh, gotta, gotta make sure that we have the, the picture since you took all that time to take the picture of it. Um, well, I think it's really interesting for us as a congregation with, uh, you know, this big example of nature uh, in New York City, like the, the big thing that people think of when they think of natural space in New York City, Central Park, right next to us. Uh, we you know, maybe sometimes take it a little bit for granted that we have this whole huge space there. Uh, but it's also, while while it's got its moments of feeling wild, it's also a very tamed, controlled sort of wilderness. It's not um, it's not anything that's just wildly growing. The It's got people that are constantly checking out every aspect of its uh, uh, ecosystem to make sure that everything's running smoothly. Um, and so many of the uh, it's often the same case with like national parks and so many of these wild spaces in the United States are, are um, under some level of control uh, that it's hard to find these these wild forest spaces, these true uh, wildernesses. Um, have you had experience? I mean, obviously you talk about um, this this land um, in um, out in the wilderness in your camping experience. Are there, have you had any other experiences? Uh, of this uncontrolled wilderness uh, that have been really stand out to you in your life? Yeah, when I was back in high school, I um, used to go on these canoeing trips in northern Minnesota and southern Ontario, which were pretty wild. Um, I, and they were, you know, I think the longest one was four weeks long, you know, without having seen other people who weren't in my group. It was a powerful experience. Um, and uh, and I think it does it does connect you with the deeper sense of what wilderness is and what forests are specifically um, because you are um, you are out there uh, not that not that you can go many places in this world that are totally untouched by civilization but i think we you know part of what being human is is looking for glimpses of things um, because our own lives are limited right we we're stuck in certain places in certain bodies with certain people and so part of what living a full life is, is taking glimpses of things that we find compelling and powerful and uh, letting those glimpses fill out a larger picture that is our life and, and is the kind of life that um, is meaningful to us. So um, so I do think you can find meaning in Central Park. Um, I preached a few years ago about the difference between New York City wilderness and, and true wilderness. Um, uh, and I think that you know, we we have to make do with what we got. Um, I think one of the striking, and this didn't make it in the sermon because I think it would have been too, um, it would have been too much of a divergent idea. But um, when I was in Ireland a few years ago, we went to um, Blarney Castle, and around Blarney Castle there is a a forest, um, and I and forest in the sense that it is. Uh, supposedly a magical place uh, that has centuries of, of age of history uh, and various things in it that you can see that are uh, that that recognize some thin thin place I suspect that most of it is fairly curated and that it's sort of created to appeal to this sense of of wanting an enchanted forest, right? For tourists who come to Barney Castle and want to have some kind of a sort of Irish magical forest experience um, with fairies and, and other things. Um, but what I think is so striking about it is that they are trying to capture something that the human spirit really desperately wants, um, which is a sense of, of magic in a space, right? And entering into a thin, a thin space. Uh, 
And uh, even though it's a manufactured version of that, it speaks to our desire for that. Uh, and it was powerful to be in it, even if it, you know, even if some wit didn't actually sit in this, you know, place and do this thing as that little sign said it happened, right? Um, you know, we want to believe that. Uh, and that speaks to, I think, what, and it, you know, what, uh, what the human nature is. And, and also the benefit of seeing forests as untamed, right? That we don't have control over. We don't, we don't always want to control things, even though we think we do. You know, the the tourist sign is like a, I saw it on Wikipedia before before Wikipedia existed. The tourist sign were the ones to spread that that slightly modified information about about a place. Um, <laughs> but it's interesting that you mention Enchanted Forest because it connects it uh, with what I ended up actually coming up with for the time for all ages was uh, briefly touching on some of the ideas in Frozen Two. And so uh, in Frozen Two, Olaf, our beloved. Uh, snowman semi-narrator figure uh, says to the group as they go to enter this enchanted forest that enchanted forces, forests are places of transformation uh, and you know I think that this is true and I think that this uh, fits well with the with the theme of of the service what are some ways that you think that uh, encountering this this liminal space in forests can really help us to uh, change and grow in ourselves yeah, I think they I think they remind us that that the world is unpredictable that of a world that isn't isn't cowed to human desires and, and control uh, that that there are powers that exist beyond those that we readily conceive in our day to day life. Um, and I think that's and that, and that there are, you know, it's a bit I think all good religions and all good holidays and all good stories help us believe in things that we might be hesitant to believe in um, when we're totally rational, conscious beings. Um, and so I think there's an entrance into, into yeah, you said liminal space, into a dreamlike state, uh, a, a sense of possibility that defies uh, maybe what we think. Uh, and that's part of why, you know, a lot of these children, child movies, Disney movies, right, they play upon forests as enchanted. You know, it, it's, it's uh, no surprise that, you know, Beauty and the Beast, Belle has to go through this woods in order to reach the beast's, you know, territory, um, you know, or, uh, you know, the seven dwarves live in a forest, right, with Snow White. Um, these are all places that that exist beyond the norm. Um, and in those places, we enter into and we, we come into a different world. Um, so I think, uh, you know, you hear about this in the musical Into the Woods as well, right, this sort of playing in with fairy tale tropes. Um, and certainly the grim fairy tales and many of the other fairy tales play on these these notions as well. Um, and I think they part of what's so compelling about them is they remind us of things that children often know really well, um, which is that the world is better off when we when you believe in and in, in the possible uh, and the magical. So I encourage folks to go spend some time in nature, especially during this wonderful fall time of year and during this thin time of Halloween. Uh, and Reverend Schuyler, thank you so much for taking time to sit down with me today. Thank you, Ember. Thank you all. Happy Halloween, everyone. <laughs>